Can, yeah. can you linger just briefly on, because you use this term a, a lot, and it'd be nice to try to get a little more color to it, which is interoception and exteroception. Uh, uh, what, are we, what are we exactly talking about? So like, what's included in each category and how much overlap is there? Interoception would be uh, an awareness of anything that's within the confines or on the surface of my skin that I'm sensing. Oh, so literally physiological. Physiologically, like, like within the boundaries of my skin and probably touch to the skin as well. Exteroception would be perception of anything that's ex beyond the reach of my skin. So the, that bottle of water, um, a, a scent, um, a sound, although, it, and this can change dramatically, actually, if you have headphones in, you tend to hear things in your head if, mm. as opposed to a speaker that's in the room. Yeah. This is actually the basis of ventriloquism. So there are beautiful experiments done by Greg Reckenzone up at UC Davis, looking at how auditory and visual cues are matched and we have an array of speakers and you can, uh, this will become obvious as I say it, but you know, obviously the ventriloquist doesn't throw their voice. Right. What they do is they direct your vision to a particular location and you think the sound is coming from that location. Yeah. And there are beautiful experiments that Greg and his colleagues have done where they suddenly introduce an auditory visual mismatch and it freaks people out because you can actually make it seem per, from a perception standpoint as if the sound arrived from the corner of the room and hit you like it physically it, yeah. and people will recoil. And so sounds aren't getting thrown across the room. They're still coming from this defined location on an array of speakers, but this is the way the brain creates these internal representations. And again, not to, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but um, I think as much as you're, you know, I'm sure the listeners appreciate this, but you know, everything in the brain is an abstraction, right? I mean, they're they're the sensory apparatus that are the eyes and ears and nose and skin and taste and all that are taking information and with interoception, it's taking information from sensors inside the body, the enteric nervous system for the gut. I've got uh, sensory neurons that innervate my liver, um, et cetera. Taking all that and the brain is abstracting that in the same way that if I took a picture of your face and I hand it to you and I'd say, that's you, you'd say, yeah, that's me. But if I were an abstract artist, I'd be doing a little bit more of what the brain does, where if I took a pen, pad and paper, maybe I could do this because I'm a terrible artist and I could just mix it up. And I let's say I would make your eyes like water bottles, but I'd flip them upside down and I'd start assigning fruits and objects to the different yeah. features of your face. And I show it to you, I say, Lex, that's you. I'd say, well, that's not me. And I'd say, no, but that's my abstraction of you. But that's yeah. what the brain does. The space time relationship of the neurons that fire that encode your face has have no resemblance to your face. Right. And, then <laughs> and they, I think people don't away. really, uh, I don't know if people have fully internalized that, but the day that I, and I'm not sure I fully internalized that because it's weird to think about, but all neurons can do is fire in space and in time, different neurons in different sequences, perhaps with different intensities. Yeah. It's not clear the action potential is all or none, although people, Neuroscientists don't like to talk about that, even though it's been published in Nature a couple times. The action potential for a given neuron doesn't always have the exact same waveform. People, it's oh, in all the textbooks, but you can modify that waveform. Well, the, the, I mean, there's a lot of fascinating stuff with uh, with neuroscience about the fuzziness of all the uh, of the transfer of information from neuron to neuron. I mean, that we we certainly touch upon it every time we at all try to think about the difference between artificial neural networks and biological neural networks. But can we uh, maybe linger a little bit on this uh, on the circuitry that you're getting at? So the brain is just a bunch of stuff firing and it forms abstractions that are fascinating and beautiful, like layers upon layers upon layers of abstraction. And I think it, uh, just like when you're programming, you know, I'm programming in Python, it's, uh, it's awe-inspiring to think that underneath it all, it ends up being zeros and ones. And the computer doesn't know about you know, stupid Python or Windows or Linux. It, it only knows about the zeros and ones. In the same way with the brain, is there something interesting to you or fundamental to you about the circuitry of the brain that allows for the magic that's in our mind to emerge? Yeah. How much do we understand? I mean, maybe even focusing on the vision system, is is there something specific about the structure of the vision system, the circuitry of it, that uh, allows for the complexity of the vision system to emerge? 
Or is it all just a complete chaotic mess that we don't understand? It's definitely not all a chaotic mess that we don't understand if we're talking about vision. Uh, and that's <laughs> okay, not just because I'm a vision scientist. Let's stick to vision. Let's stick to vision. Well, because in the beauty of the visual system, the reason David Hubel and Torrance and Weasel won the Nobel Prize was because they were brilliant and forward thinking and adventurous and all that good stuff. But the reason that the visual system is such a great model for addressing these kinds of questions and other systems are hard is we can control the stimuli. We can adjust mm -hmm. spatial frequency, how finer the gratings are, thick gratings, thin gratings. We can adjust temporal frequency, how fast things are moving. We can um, use cone isolating stimuli. We can use, it. there's so many things that you can do in a controlled way. Whereas if we are talking about cognitive encoding, right. like the, you know, encoding the space of concepts or something, right. you know, I, I, I've, you know, I like you, I, if I may, are, am drawn to the, the big questions yes. in neuroscience, but I confess in part because of some good advice I got early in my career and in part because I'm um, not perhaps smart enough to go after the really high level stuff. I also like to address things that are tractable and I want, you know, we need to, we need to address what we can stand to make some ground on at a given time. That you can now, construct brilliant controlled experiments just to study, to really literally answer questions about, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to have a talk about consciousness, but it's a, it's a scary th talk. And I'm, I think most people don't wanna hear what I have to say, which is, you know, which is, uh, we can save that for later perhaps. Or I mean, the, day, well, but, be, it's an interesting question of, uh, we talk about psychedelics, we can talk about consciousness, we can talk about cognition. Can experiments in neuroscience be constructed to shed any kind of light on these questions? So, I mean, it's cool that vision, I mean, to me, vision is probably one of the most beautiful things about human beings. Uh, also uh, from the AI side, computer vision has the, is some of the most exciting applications of uh, neural networks is in computer vision. But it feels like that's a, that's a neighbor of cognition mm -hmm. and consciousness. It's just that we maybe haven't come up with experiments to study those yet. 